So today's speaker is uh, Reverend uh, Angela Lee. Her uh, sermon title is Go and Do the Same. Uh, her verses are uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his action, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed, he crossed the, to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed him by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him, in, uh, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you next time when I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the man who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, and now and go and do the same. 好, 下面请, uh, cook. Good morning. I'm always excited to come up here because that means it's a, one of our diversity chapels. And I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker this morning, Pastor Angela Lee. She and her husband, they have uh, three beautiful children. She very proudly showed me a picture a moment ago. You'll want to see them. It's a wonderful thing. And um, yeah, she's been involved in uh, ministry for 14 years, community youth development. But since 2022, she's been the executive director of Harambi Ministries. And that's just over in Pasadena, so not very far from our dorm. So I have a, 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 a distant vision that maybe we could have people visiting your ministry or even being involved in your ministry. So we look forward to hearing from you. I love this final description uh, about uh, Pastor Angela. Passionate about Jesus, justice, and mental health, she embraces her diverse heritage and family, enjoying coffee and Peloton rides. <laughs> yeah, so please, welcome. Good morning. What an honor to be with you all. Can everybody see me okay? I know I'm sitting down, so you'll have to forgive me. Usually when I preach, just so that you know, I usually like run back and forth. I'm up and down the aisles. I'm in your face. Like I'm usually a much more charismatic preacher. So I'm going to work real hard to stay in the chair because my doctor said I need to <laughs> so I don't hurt myself. But um, like Reverend Cook said, my name is Angela Lee. Um, it is just such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, Reverend Lee. And then Miss Jessica, I don't know where she went, but thank you, Miss Jessica, for your hospitality. Thank you so much. It's just an honor to be here. I want to give a special shout out to my husband. There he is. That's my husband. There he is. I am able to do what I do and be faithful to the calling that God put on my life because of that man, because he fully supports the calling that God has put on my life to preach the gospel. And so I'm just really thankful because for weekends that I'm away at retreats or Sunday mornings when we're not at church together, I'm able to do what I'm able to do because I have an incredible partner and husband who also is a very talented preacher and teacher of the gospel as well. So um, he went to Talbot and so he also understands where you are as seminarians. So today's um, 
passage, just before I jump in, I love to say a little bit about me before I get started. Is one thing about me that I want you to know, oh, I can go up. Okay, great, this is perfect. Now I can see some of you in the back. That's great, even better. I am a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a pastor, and it is important for you to know that about me because when you hear me preach, I'm not just a preacher up here. I'm not just a pastor. Whenever I have a mic in my hand and whenever I have the chance to open God's word, all of me shows up in this moment. So I am equally a mom in this moment. I am equally a wife in this moment. I am equally a pastor in this moment. And I'm a friend and I'm a lover of Jesus, just like all of you. And I encourage you as you continue to move forward in your ministry and in the calling that God has on your life, remember, you are not one thing only. You are a full, complete, lacking nothing is what the word says. When you are in Jesus, you are lacking nothing. And the people that God brings to you, they don't need you to be one thing. They need you to show them that following Jesus in 2024 means that we're following Jesus with our whole selves, as whole people, as broken people. Can I say that? Amen, right? As imperfect people, that we are showing up as our full selves and that when living a life submitted to God, we all receive the same grace and the same mercies morning after morning. Amen? Amen. So I just want to remind you all of that, that while I have the mic in my hand, I am still just another woman trying to follow Jesus the best way that I can. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we talked about this this passage in the book of Luke. I think my slides kind of go through the scripture a bit. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to skip over the scripture because you guys already read it. Let's talk about the first point. For my note takers... This is our first point today. My points today are not gonna be traditional notes. It's gonna be questions. And the reason why I give you questions is because I want you to reflect on these questions as you move forward in ministry, okay? I don't ever want a sermon to be just a one moment and it's done. Sermons and any time we sit in the word of God, we should be able to continue to reflect on it moving forward. So the first question today is who is my neighbor? which is what the question that was posed to Jesus. So like Reverend Cook mentioned, I work at a ministry called Harambe Ministries. I was in traditional church ministry for about 13 years and then moved into neighborhood ministry. This ministry, uh, Harambe Ministries, was started about 40 years ago by a man named Dr. John Perkins. He's an incredible pastor and leader and preacher. You should read his books, he's amazing. And his wife, Miss Vera May, and they used what's called the community development model. And the community development model means that we listen first and then we serve. Repeat after me, listen first and then serve. That's it, we listen first and then we serve. So what that means is we don't do anything unless the community has said to us, this is a need. Can Christians in our community come in and meet this need? Harambe says, yes, we can. (laughs) And if we can't do it, we can find other churches who can do it. So fast forward, this organization is 43 years old. We were founded in 1982. But now in 2022, my family and I have moved to Northwest Pasadena. We used to live here in El Monte. We lived right up the street. And we moved to Northwest Pasadena But for the first nine to 10 months that we lived in Northwest Pasadena, all I did was listen. I just listened to my community. I got to know my neighbors. We're in the middle of a neighborhood, and I'll talk about that in a little while, but we're in the middle of a neighborhood. And so I sat and I listened, and I asked the question, who is my neighbor? As of 2022, when I started, I wanna share some statistics with you. Among the students in the Pasadena Unified School District, 11% reported being in a physical fight within the last 12 months. 13% of the students in the school district had seen a weapon on campus. 
3% of them reported gang involvement. Only half of the students thought that their school was safe. Only half of the students in an entire school district. And also, while black people in Pasadena, we only make up 7%, 7, 7% 7 of the city population, black students make up over 57% of the students who are suspended and expelled from schools in the school district. According to the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, it states that 60% of the students in Pasadena Unified qualify for free or reduced lunch. That means that they're living at or below the poverty line. Statistically speaking, in order to qualify for these programs, a family income must be less than $46,000 annually for a family of four. I want you to think about that. 60% of the kids in the school district live like that. The most recent data from the 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment said that the zip code where we're at, where Harambe is, we have the highest rates of children living in poverty in the service area. According to the PUSD um, diagnostic scores for reading, 62% of students in my area are below reading level for their grade. These are my neighbors. These are my neighbors. Why did I talk about statistics and ethnicity? Because these are my neighbors. These statistics are stark and they're scary and they're overwhelming. But these are my neighbors. Who is your neighbor? I can't say that I love my neighbor like Jesus tells me I should if I don't know what my neighbor needs. I'm gonna say that again. I can't love my neighbor like Jesus says I should if I don't know what my neighbor needs. Because if I don't know what my neighbor needs, then it turns into me guessing what they need and then I put my will on them. I put what I think should work on them. And then what ends up happening is we continue in a cycle of harm for our neighbors. See, the Samaritan, let's go back to the Bible. See, the Samaritan, he saw the man and he felt compassion for him. He felt compassion for his neighbors. Biblical scholars say that the use of this word in the scripture here, compassion, is a Greek ex expression built on the word for a person's inner parts. Having compassion for their inner needs, their inner feelings, their inner emotions. See friends, this is a neighborly love. This is what it means when I'm asking you the question, who is my neighbor? It's a love that goes beyond anything society or religious law expects and acts simply because of the need of another. And it's important to note that the Samaritan didn't just see this guy in any old place. If you, Mona, you spend your, all your time studying the Bible, so I'm sure you know this, that that road to Jericho, that was a dangerous place. The scene where Jesus put this story, it was a dangerous place. It was notorious for being a place where bandits would hide among switchbacks and the long steep road, robbing rich people. And still, in that risky place where no one else would stop, the Samaritan man valued the man's life over his own safety and made a decision that caring for the wounded man was more important than himself. See, I know this feeling. When I moved to Northwest Pasadena to lead, lead Harambe, I knew that, that the block that I was moving to was called Blood Corner. It's called Blood Corner because it had the highest daytime crime rate in all of Los Angeles County in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It still has a high crime rate 
not as high as it was. I knew the risk of my front wall in front of my house getting tagged by graffiti. I knew the risk of having helicopters and cops around all the time. I experienced that one morning when police officers were walking by my daughter's bedroom window with their AR-15s looking for a suspect. Walking by, I was on my Peloton, I was on my bike, working out, and here they come with their guns, and I was like, what's happening? <laughs> I know what it's like to serve in a risky place. See, that same suspect who the police were hunting dropped a bag of guns in front of my car as he fled through my backyard. But yet, God called us to this place while we still had two toddlers. My children were one and three when we moved there. And my, my daughter was... 12, my bonus daughter, my stepdaughter was 12. On this block, but God called us there to walk the neighborhood, to listen to the needs, to show up when a crisis hits because we made the decision and one that you will have to make at some point when God calls you somewhere. You will have the decision to make and your choice is going to be, is a yes to Jesus better than anything? When you answer this question, who is my neighbor? If Jesus tells you to go to the risky place, like he said with the Samaritan, like he said with me and my family, will your answer be yes, because a yes to Jesus is better than anything? See, we live in a world where it's really easy to cancel people, it's really easy to be divided by people. It's easy to think that, oh, well, you're on one side of an ideology or you're on another side of an ideology. Oh, this pastor has tattoos, she's got a story. Like, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to write narratives, right, about one another. And I'm not saying that from a place of shame. I'm saying that because I am the chief sinner among us, as the Apostle Paul says, right? But here's the trip. The things that divide us today are the same things that divided people in the New Testament. Religion, money, gender, morality, race. Those same things were the issues that Paul was writing to in the church in the New Testament. Have you noticed that? I love the Bible. I'm such a nerd. I love the Bible so much. <laughs> but I love studying the Bible because the Bible tells us things that we need to pay attention to. Hey, I'm gonna sit down, let me sit down. I get too excited, I get too excited, I get too excited. <sighs> but you know what that tells me? Is that I find it interesting that Jesus chose to make a special point to point out that the Samaritan was the one who stopped. Because Samaritans were often ridiculed because of their mix of Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. Samaritans were often counted out as people who couldn't be a part of the work of the restorative work that God was doing on the earth. So I believe that we are like the man of the law. I'll speak for myself. We are often asking, who is my neighbor? In order to count people out because we're waiting for Jesus to tell us to say, no, not them. We are waiting for Jesus to say, everyone except those people over there. But what Jesus is demonstrating for us by a Samaritan in his story is that there is no one who is outside of the reach of the grace and mercy of God. No one. And if a heart is submitted to God, that there is no one outside of the reach of who can be used by God. Hallelujah. More specifically, for those of us who are believers, there is no one who is counted out as unworthy of neighborly love and grace and compassion. No one. So who is your neighbor? Is it that classmate that gets on your nerves? Is it that professor that you think is unfair? Is it that family member who's been cruel to you your whole life? Is it that person who betrayed you in ways that no one will ever understand? Is it that person who doesn't look like you or who doesn't vote like you or who doesn't think like you? Are they your neighbor? 
The answer is yes. It's them. It's all of them. I want to encourage you that whatever barrier you have put up between you and them, whoever they are, go inward with Jesus and ask yourself the question, Lord, how, how did that get there? God, where did I begin to believe that you love some less than others? Was it my fear, Lord? Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes our life experiences, because I don't know what has happened to you. I don't know. I know what's happened to me. And I know that there are things in my life that have happened to me that have caused me to fear and fear other people. It's real. Those wounds are real. I get it. But I think that because of the sovereignty of God, both things can be true. I can confess my fear to God, and God can still be on the way of healing me. I think both of those things can be true. See, fear would have stopped the Samaritan from helping the man, like it did with the others. Because the other people said, oh, this, this person is probably like the other Jews. Oh, they're going to hurt me again. But no, the Samaritan, Jesus made him the hero of the story because the Samaritan decided that the well-being of his neighbor was the higher call. So brothers and sisters, who is your neighbor? The second point that I wanna make today, the question I wanna ask you, is what is my mission? What is my mission? As you journey through seminary, you're gonna have incredible professors who are gonna help you, they're gonna ask you questions, and they're gonna navigate with with God and with the Bible of what it is that God is calling you to do in this gospel redemptive work that God is doing on earth right now. It's kind of like this. There are a lot of fake things out there in the world today. There's fake Jordans. There's fake handbags. My eyelashes are fake. <laughs> there's a lot of fake things out there, okay? You name it. There is some form of something out there pretending to be something that it's not. Most of the time, though, real things have a serial number to let you know that it's legitimate. You have to look for it. It's not always easy to find, but once you find it, you know that it's the real thing. One of the things that burdens me today is that Christians spend so much time trying to be something that we're not. We try so hard to look like the world, to sound like the world, to talk like the world, to believe like the world. But God has called us to be set apart. We are not to look like the world. Living life on mission for God requires laser focus on God's word and allowing the word to shape us and our true identities. So if we spend so much time, time trying to fit in, then what comes out when things get tough? If we spend so much time trying to look like the world and not look like God's word, what comes out when things get hard? Would we be slow to speak and quick to listen? Probably not. Would we find someone who demonstrates the fruits of the spirit? Probably not. When things get hard, the truth is our first reaction is usually the one that we mean, <laughs> unfortunately. My question is, when things get tough, what comes out of you first? Is it mission or is it mess? Is it mission or is it mess? It's just like what the Bible says. What you hide in your heart is revealed on the tongue. Garbage in, garbage out. Likewise, word in, word out. Love in, love out. We can't give what we don't have. We can't be loving and gracious if we have not yet received that from God. I love singing goodness of God. I love that song. 
So worship team, thank you. I love that song because it's truth. We're just singing the truth. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can I tell you, I've had to, praise God, praise the Lord. I've had to sing that song when I don't believe it. I've had to sing that song when I'm mad at God. I've had to sing that song when I don't see God's faithfulness in my life. I've had to sing that song when I don't see God's goodness in my life. Can I tell you the truth? I've been through some hard things. Life has not been easy. The last two years of my life have been the hardest two years of my life. And I have wrestled with God. I've wrestled like Jacob. And I've said, I won't let you go till you bless me. And guess what? I've had a broken hip because of it. <laughs> I feel like it. <laughs> I got a busted knee. This is me and my Jacob testimony. But can I tell you, because of the time that I've spent with the Lord, when things got hard and times got tough, even when I didn't see it, I could still say the truth. Even when I didn't feel it, I could still say the true things about God. The Samaritan on the hard road, on a tough journey, when he had his own things preoccupying him, somewhere along the line, his mission was for his brother. And that mission was the thing that he leaned on when things got hard. Brothers and sisters, you must remember your call. You must remember what it is that God has told you to do. Because I don't want you wasting your time being a counterfeit. I don't want you wasting your time being fake, doing something that you're not supposed to do. I want you to squeeze every ounce of calling and mission out of your life that God has called you to do. You know, it's interesting that when Jesus is talking to the man of the law and he says, go and do the same, he's telling the man of the law to go and fulfill both what Jesus had illustrated in the parable and also the command that Jesus had given earlier in the passage. Because Jesus was clear. That's what I love about Jesus. He was clear. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When I give you the question, what is my mission, it's just that. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Differently put, as Christians, love should be like our little blue check. Now, how many of you have ever been on Instagram before? Or TikTok or Facebook? You ever been on Facebook before? Yeah. Well, we got some really holy people here, Reverend Cook. They are not on social media. <laughs> Super holy folks. God bless. <laughs> I love that. My illustration might fall, but I love that. Honestly, I need to be like, y'all. <laughs> on social media websites, to prove that somebody is who they say they are, after they have so many followers, after they go through so many security checks, they get a little blue check next to their name on social media. That's how the people who follow them know, oh, you're the real deal. Oh, you are who you say you are. Oh, you've, you've earned that little blue check. Like, you've shown over your life that you are who you say you are. It means that you can trust that person, that they're abiding by the policies that were given to them, by the practices that were given to them, that they are trustworthy. See, 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and holds us tightly because we are convinced that he has given his life for all of us. And in John 13, uh, 34 through 35, the Bible says, So now I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. 
For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. My proposition to you all today is that if we are Christians and we are to live a life that is centered on loving God and loving others, love should be our little blue check. We should be known by our love. When I ask you the question, what is my mission? Love should be your little blue check. You should be known by your love. Living missionally means that we are to be people whose love, integrity, and character flows from the Spirit through us so easily, so naturally, that it's just really attractive to other people. That other people would look at our lives and see, oh, you handle stress differently. Oh, your marriage, it looks really different. Oh, your dating relationship, it looks really different. Wow, you handle forgiveness so differently. And then people should wanna ask you, what is it? What's your source? That kind of life is to be attractive to others. Not so that we can get praise or accolades. This isn't about us, right? It is so that God can get the glory. It's so that when people see us and are attracted to our love, we can say, it's not me, it's the Lord. At the end of the day, the Lord is calling all people to himself, and what a gift, what an incredible gift that God has chosen you and me to do it. I can't, can you believe that? The same God, this is in my notes, the same God who made grass green, the sky blue, and mountains high. The God who said, ocean, stay back there. The God who said, sun, you stay here and move this way. That same God looked you in the face and said, I choose you. I want you. I love you. I don't know about you, but that brings me to tears. Thank you, Lord. Who am I? Who are we that you are mindful of us, God? as it says in the Psalms. Here's the tough part about being called by God. Sometimes I want to say no. <laughs> Sometimes it gets difficult. Sometimes saying yes to God and the plans and the purposes before you, it doesn't look like success to the world but we've been socialized, we've been taught, and we've been given a picture for what success looks like. See, I grew up in a very wealthy family. My parents, my dad worked really hard to give us a good life so that I could go to good schools and get a good education so that I could do better than them. So now when I tell them I live in a not so great neighborhood, <laughs> they're like, you live where? <laughs> they're like, you're doing what? When I, went, when I told my dad I wanted to be a pastor, he said, what else do you want to do? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes a yes to God looks foolish to the world. And here's the thing, my parents love Jesus, don't get me wrong, but they also wanted me to make six figures and live in a big fancy house. <laughs> but God called me to Northwest Pasadena, a neighborhood that is historically disenfranchised, that has historically experienced racism and educational inequality and drugs and gangs and violence and unrest. And God said to me and my husband, go there. <laughs> in the family that I grew up in, what grew in me was perfectionism and people-pleasing instead of God-pleasing. Instead, what should have grown in me, which thank God it has now, was an insatiable desire to please God and honor God with my life no matter what. At some point in your life, you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, do I really believe that Jesus is better? And I think that because of the room that you're sitting in right now, your answer is yes. See, Jesus, he set that lawyer up. 
in the Bible. He set this person up. When he said, who among the three was the loving neighbor? And in Luke 10, 37, the lawyer gave the only possible answer, the one who showed mercy to the traveler. Again, I'm going to go back to this part of the passage. Oh, sorry, it's so small. It's very small. I apologize. The Greek term here is often applied to Jesus as one who responds to the call for mercy. See, Jesus promised God's mercy to those who show mercy. So Jesus told the lawyer, go and show mercy like the Samaritan has done. By Jesus speaking and saying it so plainly, he made a clear claim that everyone in the family of God is called to display God's mercy and to love the world. But I wonder if there's anybody here today who's ever, if you maybe ever felt counted out of God's call. If you hear me talking about going to unreached places, going to unreached people, and you think, oh no, that's not me. Let me tell you something. I'm talking to you. <laughs> if you're in this room and you feel like you have maybe lost your way, or maybe other things have taken priority, I get it. I have a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a 14-year-old, a husband, a full-time job. I get it. Sometimes things get in the way. But let's be real. There is nothing more practical when it comes to asking this question, what is my mission, than praying, than spending quiet time with the Lord. What you will get in that time with God if you really ask the Lord this question in earnest the Lord will begin to put puzzle pieces of your life together and the Lord will say, remember when I let you go through this? I want you to use it for my glory. Do you remember when you were hurt by this thing? I want you to use it for my glory. Do you remember when I allowed you to sit and learn this in seminary class? I want you to use it for my glory. So that at the end of it all, you will realize that your life has been stitched together by the God of glory. I want to leave you with a thought, with a scripture to think about. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, we can only do this if we've gone first. We can only go baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them the commands of Jesus if we've listened to the commands of Jesus first. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. We can only teach people the way of Jesus when we have walked that path first. We can only teach people how to live on mission for Jesus when we've done it first. We can only teach people how to love their neighbor when we've done it first. My mission field for this season of our life is in Northwest Pasadena. Where is yours? For some of you, it might be your living room with your families or with your roommates. For some of you, it might be a place where following Jesus is unpopular, where maybe it's even a little hostile. But can I remind you that when you have the answer to the question, who is my neighbor and what is my mission? You will be in alignment with the God of heaven, with the master of the universe, who will not leave you, who will not forsake you, who will not let you fall. Wherever it is that God is calling you to be faithful, friends, be faithful. Do it with your whole heart. God's glory. And just as Jesus told the man of the law to be merciful, now I tell you, go and do the same. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for the opportunity to be together. God, I ask that you, Holy Spirit, you are here, that you would minister to hearts and minds right now in this room. God, that you would speak in a way like only you can. Thank you, Lord, that your word does not come back void. 
God, I ask that you would leave us, Lord God, that we would leave this place different, changed by your Holy Spirit, more molded into your image. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen.